Uh, the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. Mr. Fergal McKinney is not in his place. I call Mr. Sam Gardner. Question number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. With your, mis with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'll answer questions two and three together. Um, on the 18th of November, I launched a public consultation on my proposals for a successor to the Tripsy Framework 2011-15 to operate in the period post-2016. I would encourage stakeholders to respond to the consultation, which will run until the 20th of January. My department held a stakeholder event, a stakeholder event on the 10th of December as part of the public consultation to provide rural stakeholders with an opportunity to discuss the proposals and to provide feedback. The successor um, Tripsy framework will be produced following completion of the public consultation. And it's my intention to publish a final framework document in March 2016. I'm very proud of the achievements that have been delivered under the current Tripsy framework. The recent report on the evaluation of the framework demonstrates the positive impact that Tripsy has made to the lives of rural dwellers across a range of areas, including access to transport and broadband services, promotion of positive mental health, addressing fuel poverty, and supporting community development in rural areas. The evaluation shows the framework's success in encouraging the development and implementation of a range of measures designed to target access poverty, financial poverty and social isolation among vulnerable groups in rural areas. In total, 17 individual measures have been delivered under the current framework, and one of its greatest strengths has been its flexibility, enabling it to bring together a broad range of organisations to work in partnership to address a wide range of rural issues. The Art Committee has also recognised the success of the current Tripsy framework in its position paper, which it published in March of last year. I want to ensure that the successor Tripsy framework builds on the success of the current framework and continues to deliver real benefits for the most vulnerable rural dwellers. Call Mr. Gardner for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer thus far. But will the Minister be aware that, however, the new proposed framework includes no mention of the previous support for Protestant and unionist communities to apply for rural development funding, despite it being known that they need additional support, and will the Minister now consider this? Thank the Member for his question, and, and as he knows, we are out to consultation, and I certainly will listen to all views, but if, if you remember why the PUL funding actually came into place was because there was an identified need in that there was an under um, capacity in terms of reaching out and, and trying to attract funding for the PUL community. That need has maybe um, now suggested that it's been met, but certainly as part of the consultation, I'm open to listening to all views on the way forward. But I wouldn't want to make false promises. It was an identified need. That need was met, but certainly we'll take a look at everything as a result of the responses that we received from the consultation. Mr. Sean Roger. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for answers thus far. Minister, when do you expect the rural proofing bill to come to the floor of the Assembly? And what financial provision will be made for that rural proofing programme? which will be expected to be born out of such legislation? Well, the Rural Needs Bill was introduced to the Assembly on the 9th of November and on the 17th of November then I was delighted to see that the bill passed its second stage. It currently stands referred to the um, ARD committee for the committee stage and the committees to conclude um, their stage and publish its report on the 26th of January, um, so over the next number of weeks. You'll be aware that the bill produce, um, proposes to introduce a statutory duty in all departments and local councils which will require rural needs to be taken into account when they're developing and implementing government policies and strategies and delivering public services. It's also going to support the equitable treatment of rural dwellers by requiring their needs to be appropriately considered in the development and delivery of policy and public services. For me, this bill is key in terms of um, trying to shape policies and, st and strategies at the beginning within departments. It's about making all departments consider and seriously take on board the, their responsibilities to rural dwellers because, I, as I have consistently said, the needs of rural dwellers are not just the responsibility of my department. They are indeed the responsibility of all departments. This bill certainly will make sure that that's the case. I don't believe that um, in terms of um, support, the support that my department will provide to other departments will be around practical support. It will be around um, helping departments to, to understand what it is that they need to be doing in terms of rural um, proofing their, their policies and strategies. I don't believe that there's a massive financial contribution um, or ask of, of all departments to actually be able to do something which they previously have committed to do within the executive, which is to, to rural proof. But this bill will make sure that that's done on a statutory basis. Members, would you please note that question four was withdrawn. I call Mr Oliver Mike Mullen for a question. Sorry, Mike, ever a coup, question five. The pig industry is an important sector here, and I was delighted whenever China's certification agency announced its intention 
to approve, approve plants in the north for pork exports to China, subject to completing some remedial actions identified as part of their audit earlier last year. Securing access to one of the, new, of, the, of the primary new markets outlined in the Going for Growth initiative is a very welcome development, and followed by my third visit to China in June of last year, which focused on negotiating these vital pork approvals. The commencement of pork exports to China will represent a major boost for the local pork industry. It is difficult to precisely quantify the potential value of this market because of uncertainty around factors such as exchange rates and potential demand and competition from other exporters. The industry has indicated this trade could generate as much as $10 million in revenue per year for our pork sector. Given the uncertainties, it is difficult to know if this potential can be realised, but I think that when we work with the industry and look forward to the potential that is there and for the industry to reach into what is a uh, what is expected to become the world's leading per capita consumer of pig meat by 2022, and certainly what we have to offer is something that um, the Chinese um, market obviously values, given that they have allowed entry. I and my department will continue to invest much time and energy into opening up new markets, and I am delighted to announce that our agri-food industry is now beginning to trade with two of the, of the vital new markets that we established in 2015. The first shipment of pork to India arrived in the port at the end of December. And our base sector is also preparing to trade with the newly opened Canadian market. Trading with new countries, I hope, will also help to mitigate the negative impacts of price volatility and exchange rate fluctuations that the industry have faced. Mr. McMillan, for a supplementary. Well, Margaret, can I thank the Minister for a comprehensive uh, answer? But could the Minister tell us, has there been any, any progress in gaining export approval for uh, other agri food uh, produce to China? The the local beef and the poultry sectors in the north have indicated that China remains one of their top priority markets. As such, access to that market remains one of my key ministerial priorities. The Chinese have recently signed a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, with Britain and the north, which lays the foundations for discussion on a range of issues, including agreeing terms to export chicken and beef. That is very much a, a positive step in the process, but as we have seen with pork, there is still a lengthy process ahead before exports can commence. There has also been a TSE, the um, working group which set up, um, which we are hopeful will facilitate uh, negotiations of beef exports in particular. An FB export represents their interest in this specialist group. And I think that um, when we look towards what are the potential there, there is certainly a lot of potential. And I think working in tandem with the industry, we can continue to um, drive home the message that we have a, a fantastic product to offer, that we have a clean green image, and that we use that to our advantage when we are out and about and selling our wares in terms of getting into other um, potential markets. Call Mr. Robin Swan for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Minister's announcements this morning that our agri food is now getting into India and Canada. Can she give the House some sort of estimate as to the size of those two potential markets and also an update as to what she's doing to get our Northern Ireland beef into the American markets? Yes, that remains to be one of our priorities, particularly in relation to the American um, market. We want to build on the successes that we've had, but I think that. Um, one of the, we're working very closely with the industry around the US market and also the Philippine market for beef, so that they're key markets which the industry have identified. Um, we also um, are working hard in terms of Australia in relation to pork. So there's a number of um, key areas which the industry wants us to focus on, and very much for me, that, that's the way that we should be targeting these, these new markets. We've had quite a, um, some success um, in terms of the monetary value of getting into these new markets. Obviously, it is dependent just on the take-up. If we open up the new market, then it is for the industry to go out and try and get themselves into that market, but it is very much working in tandem with um, my department and the enterprise um, department around um, showcasing our products wherever we can, but also letting um, everybody know that what we have is fully traceable food, food that we can stand over, that we have very wholesome food, and I think that is certainly one of our strengths. It is certainly one of our biggest marketing tools which we can use. Well, Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister on what date does she anticipate the first sale of pork to the Chinese market uh, will take place? Well, that's very much down to the industry now. The market has been opened. Um, they are in negotiations. The industry, different um, producers are in, the, in negotiations with potential buyers in China. So, no, I don't have a date to give you, but certainly um, what we needed and what the industry needed was the market opened. I've secured that, so it's now over to the industry to actually um, hopefully achieve sales. And as I said, the figures that are referred to, we're talking potentially around about £10 million in revenue for the pork sector alone for just from getting into the Chinese market with, with what we did last year. Mr. Jim Allister. Bearing in mind the very protracted nature of the inspection process for pork in regard to the Chinese market, in respect of the hope 
to get poultry meat and beef into the Chinese market? Is it going to be the same torturous inspection process, or is anything done to date uh, going to shorten that process? We would like to think that given all the work that we've done over the last number of years to build up the confidence of the Chinese in, in our um, systems and processes, that they will um, take some comfort from the fact that we have com uh, conformed everything they asked in terms of inspection regimes, that they can see that we have very high standards in our, in our um, processing factories. When, when the inspectors came here, they were certainly impressed by what they saw. So hopefully that will lead to, um, whilst I'm not saying it's going to shorten the, the process by an awful long by a, a large amount of time, but we can say hopefully that it will lead to um, confidence being there from the start that we're maybe hitting the ground running in terms of access for other products. Mr. Declan McAleer for a question. Uh, question six, My department's rural development programme for the 2014 to 20 period was formally adopted by the European Commission on the 25th of August last year. The programme is a £623 million package of support that will benefit the farming and food sectors, rural communities, rural businesses and also the environment. An important element of the rural development programme is the opportunity for cooperation between ourselves in the north and those in other member states, including the south. A distinct scheme within the programme supports cooperation between local action groups who will deliver the leader measures of the RDP. Through the All Island Co Cooperation Scheme, LAGs will be encouraged to collaborate with groups in other regions to share knowledge, innovate and acquire skills. An allocation of four million has been ring fenced to meet the cost of projects funded through the All Island Cooperation Scheme. And my officials are in contact with their counterparts in England, Scotland, and Wales, and with um, colleagues in the South to develop common principles that will reduce the red tape associated with cross-border and transnational cooperation. My officials and their colleagues in the South have also met to discuss a mechanism to facilitate cooperation between our lags, and I'm pleased that officials are proposing an event to be held during the spring of this year to which LAGs and relevant stakeholder organisations from across the island and beyond will be invited. A call for cross-border cooperation projects will also be opened later this year. The benefits of cooperation are multidimensional, and through the Rural Development Programme, cross-border projects could help industry to target new markets, introduce new approaches to rural tourism, or to provide economy of scale to enable activities that would not have been feasible within a single area. Mr. Michael, here for supplement. I'm going to thank the Minister for her answer. Could the Minister tell us what type of projects will benefit from the um, cooperation element of LEADER? During um, programme development, a number of areas were identified where there is potential to support cooperation activities to achieve the programme's aims and objectives. Providing so support for cooperation will provide new opportunities to bring potential beneficiaries together to overcome fragmentation, undertake innovative activities and projects that are new and also to support new cooperation groups. There is going to be support for European operational groups and for innovative projects to address agricultural sustainability. These um, groups will be required to share the results of their projects um, within the six counties here, but also more widely right across Europe. And other cooperation support includes an agri-food cooperation scheme for small and micro businesses to reduce their marketing, logistics and distribution costs, and innovative methods and of sharing resources. However, this cooperation is unlikely to have a cross-border element, but I think that um, the member will be able to see that there's quite a programme of activities which um, we look forward to being taken forward to build on the successful projects that we've seen in the programme that's now coming to an end. Call Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister what percentage of RDP monies will be going uh, towards encouraging the growth and protection of rural communities, such as my constituency in West Rome, going forward? Have the figure for the breakdown of the figure for West Rome, but um, £70 million is the entire figure for Priority 6, which is the, the area of work which will look towards supporting rural communities through a number of measures, whether that be in relation to access to basic services within communities, whether that be for um, tourism projects, for small business investment um, schemes. So the local lags are now currently devising their local strategies. They have submitted them to me. I'm working my way through them and hope to be able to sign off on them. Um, over the next number of weeks, which will allow um, spend and the programmes um, to open for applications over the very immediate future. Mr. Kieran McCarthy for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number seven to the Minister. Before any farmer considers installation of renewable energy technologies, consideration needs to be given to ways to improve the energy efficiency of their farm businesses. To assist with this process, CAFRI Development Services provides guidance and training on energy efficiency through its industry training programme that involves workshops and events such as the practical on-farm renewable energy events which have been delivered annually since 2010. 
Over the past several years, approximately 300 farms per annum have had their energy use benchmarked. In addition, the, the dairy unit at Caffrey encompasses a number of leading edge energy efficiency technologies that are demonstrated to farmers through Caffrey's Knowledge and Technology Transfer Programme. Caffrey students, the young farmers of the future, also avail of information on energy efficiency and on how new energy efficiency or renewable technologies can be implemented in a practical way on farm. These training courses, coupled with technical articles supplied to the agriculture press, ensure that the local farm and community are aware of options open to them and that they are more energy efficient on their farms and more sustainable through the use of renewable energy technologies. The Rural Development Plan approved by the European Commission includes a proposed business investment scheme and feasible study, feasibility studies into renewable energy projects will be eligible for support and it is vital that farmers or groups of farmers take decisions on an informed basis. Financial assistance with the purchase of installation of renewable energy technologies is no longer eligible for support due to the generation incentives renewable obligations are already in place. However, successful projects under, under previous grant schemes for renewable energy installations on farms under the European Sustainable Competitive, Competitiveness Programme provide a demonstration facility for a range of technologies that may be suitable to those interested in microgeneration. Mr McCarthy for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. That's a very long, convoluted answer, and it's very difficult to uh, keep, keep in one's mind all of the, the uh, issues that she raised. But the Minister will be aware that our, I'm sure she has noticed in the Belfast Telegraph the other morning where uh, farmers in my constituency growing the, the famous Cumber Spud receive 14 pence a kilo for their, their products, yet at the same time the supermarkets are charging over a pound. In those circumstances, those dire circumstances that the farmers face, them, uh, will the Minister ensure that every opportunity is given to those farmers and landowners uh, for funding to ensure that energy saving is a priority on their farms and businesses? Yes, and I'm very happy to send the member the answer to my question in writing so we can study it in more detail afterwards and we have time to, to take it all in. Um, but I think your, your point's a fair enough point in relation to the price that farmers receive for what they produce, absolutely, and that's always been um, one of my major concerns, which is why you'll be aware that I have brought forward the work that we're doing around the supply chain forum to look at fairness in the supply chain. We have a strategy to grow the industry, to work with potato growers or, or any of the other um, sectors, but the only way we're going to be successful with that is if there is furnace in that supply chain. If all elements of that supply chain work together, so for me, it's a very much about a sea change in attitudes right across that supply chain. The farmer should not be the person that's continually pushed for the price um, reduction. So I, I, I certainly share your concerns in relation to that, and will continue to do all that I can. We have a new rural development programme which is about to come online, which will support farmers to look at energy efficiency. It will support them to look at how they can be more efficient. We have CAFRI advisors on the ground helping farmers to be more efficient. So absolutely everything that I can do um, to help farmers in that regard, then I'll not be found wanting. Could I remind members that they must continue to rise in their place if they wish to be called for a supplementary? I call Mr Adrian Cochrane Watson. <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her extensive answer on renewables so far? But will the Minister agree with me that the Enterprise Minister has created a policy vacuum which has led to a financial crisis for local farmers, local landowners who had invested and planned for single wind turbines? Yes, I understand the, the concerns, and the concerns certainly have been raised um, with me from the farming industry in relation to the decision not to move forward. So, um, as you've rightly said, DETI are the lead department in terms of energy, ge energy generation matters, but um, I have um, flagged up my concerns as have been relayed to me by the farming industry who were obviously planning for taking forward um, some energy efficiency measures and have now been told that they won't have the grant aid. So I think it's a genuine concern, something that we need the DETI minister to reflect on and, I, and I, I'm assured that that's what's happening. Mr Conor Murphy. The, the Minister has just made reference, uh, I thank her for her answers so far, it made reference to the concerns in relation to the renewables obligations, the, the abrupt, a proposed abrupt closure of that scheme, and I hope she continues to talk to the Deputy Minister to try and secure uh, an outcome for farmers that is satisfactory to them, because there is widespread concern in the farming community about that. Uh, and in light of that, what, is her own department, uh, what steps will her own department be taking to promote uh, uptake of renewable energy? Yeah, and again, I thank the member for his questions and, and um, share the concerns which I said I have relayed to the Deputy Minister and we will continue to discuss that as um, we come to a final decision in relation to um, going forward. In terms of the steps that the Department takes to promote the update 
uh, the uptake of renewable energy um, as part of the department's renewable energy action plan. We've held two practical on-farm renewable energy events um, in Greenmount and in Eskillen. And these events invite various departments and outside stakeholders to showcase the renewable energy technologies and innovations which they have developed. Seminars and workshops are arranged at which um, government officials and industry representatives combine to deliver practical advice to farmers on the types of renewable energy technologies that are suitable for our local farmers. And a range of other measures are also delivered through um, the Renewable Energy Action Plan, including the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Training offered by CAFRI, visits to the Renewable Energy Research Centre at AFPI, and Focus Farms, which all showcase renewable energy supply chains. Call Mr. Andy Allen for a question. Question 8, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to advise that significant progress has been made with the East Belfast Flood Alleviation Scheme, with works to replace a culvert under the Castle Ray Road now complete. Flood alleviation works at Clara Park and are ongoing, with the road culvert recently replaced. In the early part of 2016, downstream, flood alleviation works along Sandhill Parade will progress. The Integrated Conswater Community Greenway East Belfast Flood Alleviation Scheme Phase 2 is working on 13 um, fronts across East Belfast, with good progress being made across all areas. The combined flood alleviation schemes will protect 1,700 homes and businesses. These integrated works in both, include both environmental improvements associated with the Greenway project and flood alleviation are estimated to cost in the region of 12 million in total. Mr. Allen, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, and indeed, I would like to pay tribute to the agencies and staff who have worked so hard in making this alleviation scheme a success so far. Um, indeed, East Belfast is relieved that the worst of recent flooding uh, never, never was, wasn't on its doorstep. However, would the Minister be concerned at DSD's decision to delay dredging at the River Lagan in an attempt to save £3 million that could potentially contribute to a future serious flooding in that area? I don't have the detail of um, the DSD decision, so perhaps you might want to take that up with the DSD Minister um, it's, it, if, if there is an issue. I, I think that um, certainly over the last number of, of weeks, and certainly maybe six or eight weeks, with all the recent flooding, dredging has been a very topical conversation. Um, suffice to say, and I said it in this house yesterday when I was answering um, questions in relation to flooding, dredging wouldn't have solved the problems that we um, experienced recently with Loch Erne and Loch Ney in relation to flooding. Um, if, if, it, if it is a, uh, an issue in relation to the DSD decision, then I, I suggest you take it up with her. It certainly not, wasn't an issue for um, the, experience and the flooding that we've experienced recently because of extreme weather. Mr. Rosie McCarley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. And can I ask the Minister, how does her department engage with communities which are in danger from flooding? I think certainly lessons of the, um, the last number of weeks have shown that um, that engagement is absolutely critical. The, I think that um, certainly everybody can point to the fact that the multi-agency approach in relation to flooding recently has been key. When we talk about it's multi-agency, but it's, it's the agencies, it's councils and it's communities working together. I um, very much could see that, for example, where Rivers Agency have put sandbag stores in place where local communities were able to access them um, whenever there was potential flooding to homes and properties. So for me, that, that um, continued engagement with communities is absolutely vital. And I think that it really, really helps us in terms of being able to respond to um, flooding instances. I think as part of Council's new um, emergency plan and, and, and flood emergency response plans, the deployment of um, using resources of everybody working together, of working with communities is, as I said, absolutely key and has stood, I think, communities well over the last number of weeks. Well, Mr. William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I ask the Minister, in relation to flooding, will the Minister uh, give an assurance to the House that she will endeavour to get uh, financial aid to farmers and businesses <laughs> that have been affected in recent days? My position hasn't changed from what I told you yesterday, that um, certainly we now have £1.3 million being made available. The Executive has committed to using that £1.3 million for flood protection and flood, flood prevention. There's, there's a task force, uh, uh, a ministerial group, which is going to report to the Executive next Thursday, which will take a look at it. I, I told you yesterday, and, and it remains the case, I've tasked officials with actually getting a 
proper readout of the situation and how farmers have been impacted. I'm certainly aware of a small number of farmers who have been impacted in relation to fodder, getting access to fodder, their fodder is perhaps all being destroyed. So um, I'm going to take a look at all of that and we'll gather that information. The priority for the last number of weeks has been dealing with the actual flooding situation, but certainly, yes, we have some additional money now and we'll take a look at how best we can use that for to, to uh, make a difference to people. I, I think that it's important but that we gather the information to actually see what the damage is and, and what has been the impact. Well, Mr. Thomas Buchanan. In its first year of operation, rural micro capital grants of up to £1,500 have been awarded to 370 community and voluntary groups to improve and develop their facilities and assets. Through phase one of the programme, 146 projects were funded, and my officials are now in the process of paying these grant claims. The second phase of the programme closed for applications on the 30th of October, and from this, an additional 224 groups have been offered funding to deliver micro-projects along the themes of modernisation, health and wellbeing and ICT. The local rural support networks who are administering the programme on behalf of DARD have worked hard to have letters of offer issued during December. Feedback from the first phase of the programme has shown that these rural micro-projects have helped strengthen communities and have allowed groups to improve and expand the services they deliver. I am confident that the second phase projects will replicate this. A diverse range of groups spanning a broad spectrum of interests have benefited from a micro-grant and despite the value of individual grants being relatively low, the impact of these projects locally and collectively across the north is significant. Overall, the Rural Microcapital Grant Programme is proven to be an extremely effective component of my department's tackling rural poverty and social isolation framework. Mr Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her response. And given the success of, this, uh, of, of these two uh, programmes, and the uptake, especially I know from my own constituency of West Tyrone, there's been a, a great uptake in it. Uh, does the Minister foresee that the Department could rule out a third phase of this at some time in the future? Yeah, you, you'll be aware that we're out to consultation now in relation to the new programme for Tripsy. I'm certainly committed to announcing a new programme for um, future years before the end of March. And I think that when we look at um, what projects we will roll forward, we take a look at what was effective and what worked. This programme certainly worked. And we need to take an assessment then just based on the second round, which again was um, fully subscribed and we were able to spend out um, to, to help community groups and voluntary groups to, um, along the three themes that, I, that I've identified. So um, certainly I'm very open to looking towards if this scheme is, is something that's needed again, or are there other schemes that we possibly could take forward that could make a difference given that we maybe have met <coughs> need in relation to, to this programme. But certainly I'm very open to making sure that we have a fully funded capital scheme going forward and resource scheme for, for TRIPSI. Mr. Barry Michael Duff. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask the Minister what, what has been the total value in financial terms uh, from the projects to date, and in future, you know, what type of projects will benefit? Um, in terms of the, the capital grant scheme itself, so it was up to £1,500 for, um, for all this, the, the individual grant schemes, and we've had in the first phase 370 community voluntary groups, and then the second phase. 224 groups have been offered funding. So very significant impact in terms of delivering. And it can be something simple for a small community group, like getting a photocopier so they can do their community bulletin. So I think it's certainly something that um, has been, certainly been very, very effective. And I look forward to being able to roll out something similar for the future. Um, there was a number of, um, of I'm trying to say, uh, we think we talked about, about 176,000 was the total for um, the first phase and 367,000 in, in the second phase. So quite a significant investment in rural communities. Mr George Robbins. Question 10, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have written to the Minister of the Environment to highlight my concerns about the potential impact of CTY10A on young farmers who have set up as head of Holton and recently established farm businesses, and he has recently responded. I have sought the Environment Minister's assurance that consideration of this element of planning policy would not become a deterrent to young farmers establishing new businesses. In addition, my officials have met with officials from the Department of the Environment on this specific issue and will continue to do so to ensure a satisfactory outcome for young farmers. I have demonstrated my commitment to young farmers by introducing the young farmer top-up payment in the <coughs> recent reform of CAP um, direct payments to encourage the development of the next generation of farmers. I'm afraid there isn't time for a supplementary because that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions and I call Lord Morrow.
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, my question is still on the theme of the vexed situation of flooding, the serious flooding in Fermanagh and South Tyrone, at least. The Minister has intimated on a number of occasions, and again here today, that she is looking at the situation. And I'm wondering when does she stop looking and when does she start doing? Is it not time that some decisive action was done and establishing a subcommittee is but a step? But could she, can we expect a report this week? <clears throat> well, I've very much been in the doing mode um, over the last um, six, eight weeks. We have been on the ground. We've been making sure that our agencies are actually on the ground delivering for people, for businesses, trying to mitigate the worst effects, making sure that grills were cleared, making sure that the multi-agency approach was correct. Um, and I think that that certainly has borne out well in terms of um, the impact to communities. Those communities that have impa been impacted, particularly in Fermanagh, um, in areas south Throne, in around the shores of Loch Ney, have been devastated and cut off. For, for those properties that have been flooded, those people have been devastated. For those people that have been cut off to um, everyday life, been cut off because they can't get their homes might not have flooded, but the, the land around them is flooded. That has caused considerable challenges. So I think that collectively, um, the effort had to be. The priority had to be actually doing the work on the ground, helping those people through what is an ongoing situation as agencies remain on high alert. The review, which I talked about and talked about yesterday in this House, is something that um, I always do after there's been a flooding incident, and that's something that needs to take a look at um, all the factors. So we'll have two reviews. We'll have a, an engineering review. So are there other engineering solutions that need to be taken forward in terms of um, but we look at everything? We will look at dredging. We will look at the levels of the lock. We will look at the rainfall. We also need to have a review of the multi-agency approach and how effective that, that has been. Certainly the assessment to date has been a positive one, but I think it's important that we take a step back and, and review that. So um, there's been quite a significant body of work that's been ongoing in working to support communities over the last number of weeks. Call Lord Morrow for supplement. Well, could I just remind the Minister, she says she's been on the ground. She certainly wasn't on the ground when 31 retail units were flooded in the Linen Green in Mygashal, because I understand she refused to go out. And I think that that was in very poor taste. And I think the Minister at least owes those retailers an apology because of the negligence of her and her department. And can the Minister give an assurance today that the problem that existed there has, will be remedied to such an extent that it will not happen again because it was sheer negligence? <clears throat> well, I, mean, I don't agree with your assessment in relation to sheer negligence. What happened at the Linen Green site was very clearly an example of, of the block grill. The grill, the grill was cleared in advance of the storm. It was left clear. Unfortunately, we had extreme weather. We had a storm condition. We had three storms, in fact. But that storm in particular that affected led to extreme rain. It led to high winds, which meant that debris got blocked up in the grill. As soon as the grill was cleared and that was identified as a problem, the water flowed away within a half an hour. The member will be very aware to all of the facts in relation to that. I never refused to go anywhere. I'm very able, I'm very happy to go and meet anybody at any time in relation to flooding issues and the response of my agency in relation to dealing with them. My priority over the last number of weeks, certainly all over the holiday period, has been about making sure that my agencies are on the ground, to making sure that my department as a lead department were holding everybody else to account, to making sure that everything practically that could be done was being done. That has been the priority, that continues to be the priority as we remain on high alert. Fortunately, the levels of the lock, for example, are coming down which impacts in the Fermanagh flooding situation and in the Loch Ness situation. So the, in terms of um, meeting with the residents or the businesses in the Linen Green, I have absolutely no problem meeting with anybody at any time. And I can stand over, I can stand over the work that's being done in terms of um, trying to support businesses who have been impacted by flooding, and I will continue to do that. The priority for me, as I said, is about actually getting the, what needs to be done on the ground, and that's certainly what Rivers Agency have been about. Call Mrs. Brenda Hale for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister who is responsible for plant health in Northern Ireland? Plant health comes under the remit of, the de of my department. Call Mrs. Hale for <laughs> supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your very short but to the point answer. You stated in December 2015 that the Forest Service has a vital role in protecting plant health and our ecosystem and in promoting the rural economy and tourism. Hillsborough Forest Park is the second most visited park in Northern Ireland, but unfortunately I've been contacted by constituents who also happen to be professionals in countryside management and estates keeping who are increasingly concerned by the poor management of Hillsborough Park, the felled trees left lying when they could have been used for commercial timber and are now left rotting and upsetting the balance of moisture and temperature that is vital to the biodiversity 
diversity, not to mention the safety issues, and they are an absolute eyesore. You have just said, Minister, me. you don't ref refuse to visit, so I would welcome you to Hillsborough Forest Park to discuss the issues. But in the interim, what will you do to actively ensure proper management and effective management of our forests? Well, perhaps the best thing to do um, for the member would be that if I got um, Forest Service to contact you to discuss the concerns that you've just now highlighted with me for the very first time. Mr. Robin Swan for a topical question. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, on the 6th of January, the DEFRA Minister Liz Trust announced to the Oxford Farming Conference that they were bringing forward legislation in April that would allow farmers across England finally to maintain and manage their own ditches up to the length of one mile. Would the Minister consider this as an option for farmers in Northern Ireland actually to be able to maintain and manage their own shucks? It's, it's not something that I have considered, but yes, um, I think that we'll always look towards um, examples of uh, good practice, if that's the case. Um, this legislation, that we won't have time in this mandate to bring forward any other legislation, but certainly um, it's worthwhile flagging it up now, and let's take a look if there is something that can be done in the future, but it's not something I'm considering doing before the end of this mandate. Mr Swan, for a supplementary. In the current climate, the criticism the Minister has been given where they're fairly or unfairly haven't, haven't done nothing in regard to, to the potential f flooding that's been and the flooding that's coming. Will she consider it and ask her department officials to actually have a look at it now? Because I know Rivers Agency was in front of the, the Committee for Agriculture and Rural Development and there wasn't an awful lot of positive suggestions coming forward, but I think this is actually one that could help farmers in Northern Ireland and actually could be an answer to the problems. I'm aware that um, Rivers Agency officials were in front of the committee today and there was a fulsome discussion in relation to all elements in relation to flooding. I do not agree with your assertion and I don't think you would expect me to stand up here and agree that, um, with you that on your political point scoring that I have been doing nothing in relation to flooding. I have been on the ground, I have been doing the work, I have been holding my agencies to account. I think that's the job of a minister. Well, Mr William Irwin for a topical question. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. And in relation, Minister, to basic farm payments, a many farm basic farm payment applications were still to be verified at the 31st of December 2015. Still to be verified. I don't have the figures. Um, we now are in a position where we're around about 96% of people have been paid. We have paid over 1,700 inspection cases, which is um, significantly improvement year on year. As you know, I, I have made improvements year on year. This year, given all the complexities of dealing with embedding the new cap reform, I think the fact that we've been able to achieve that target is extremely significant and hopefully something that you as chair of the yard committee would welcome those people that remain to be paid we're working our way through those applications and you'll know that my intention and my target is to have those all paid by the end of march so we're down to small numbers although i always be careful of saying that if you're in that category waiting for your payment then obviously you'd be stressed and waiting for it so we're, we're aiming to get um, those people paid um, by the end of march mr Irwin, for a, top, uh, for a supplementary i thank the minister for a reply and i will acknowledge that uh, Northern Ireland and our department has done very well in getting uh, a large percentage of payments out, and indeed I think it's the highest anywhere in the UK. But it's cold comfort to those that are still waiting. Can the Minister tell us what percentage of payments, basic farm payments are still to be paid? Uh, the number of single farm payments, not, not, not the percentage, the percentage is 4% it looks like, but I surmise it might be slightly higher, but we uh, uh, will take your word for that one. I'll confirm for you in writing later today the exact number, but yes, we have just over 96% paid, so 4% of um, the total applications, so 4% of about 25, 26,000, but I'll confirm the number for you later. Mr. Ian McRae for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister um, provide uh, me with an update on what help she's giving to encourage young farmers who are trying to become the head of holding um, to actually achieving it? Well, I think the fact that we now have um, the profile of, of the farming community was significantly towards the older generation, but I think the fact that we now have um, the Young Farmers Payment Scheme, which we're, we're paying out the maximum amount of money there, has shown that we now have over 2,000 people who identify themselves as young farmers, which is a very significant change in that profile. I think the fact that so many young farmers have actually enrolled in our business development groups is very positive. Um, our CAFRI advisors are on hand to work with um, young farmers around um, looking towards planning for their future businesses. We're doing a lot of work around succession planning, so working with families around what, what they're planning for the future and their future needs for their, their family business. So um, quite a significant um, body of work is ongoing. Also working with the Young Farmers Club, obviously that's an ongoing piece of work where I fund them to work and to engage with young farmers also. Well, Mr McRae for supplementary. 
there has and probably is still a concern within young farmers' organisations that there are obstacles put in place by the department. Will the minister give an assurance that um, there's certainly nothing that she's doing to, to put any barriers in place and that if there is barriers within the department that she ensure that they're removed and that young farmers can um, become the head of holding? Certainly no barriers. All we need is for young people to, um, we set out the criteria that we need to, um, people to abide by for the scheme. Um, quite a significant body of those have all been processed, <laughs> but I'm keen to make sure that um, we have the young farmers, who, who are particularly the new young farmers coming on, are allocated their entitlements, who receive their basic payment, who get their young farmers top up when they get that as quickly as possible. A significant number have been paid. There's certainly no barriers. It's just working our way through that process. But as I said in a previous answer, we're quite um, we're, we're very much getting there. We're, we're at over 96% now, and hopefully those remaining 4% over the next number of weeks will be processed. Call Mrs. Dolores Kelly for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, on more than one occasion, you have admitted to being the lead minister uh, in leading the executive response to the recent uh, flooding incident. Can you then tell this House whether or not you have made explicit a representation to your executive colleagues to extend the eligibility criteria for financial support to local businesses. You're correct. I am the lead minister, and I have the lead department in terms of flooding. And I think that um, that approach is something that I, uh, on the back of the PEGI report in 2012, decided that one department needed to, to take the lead. I showed political leadership. I stepped up and I um, put it to the executive that we agree that my department take the lead. In terms of um, how we're going to support people and going forward. I believe the £1.3 million pound that we've been allocated, the, um, the priority has to be around prevention. It has to be about doing work before people get flooded. So the executive, thankfully, yesterday um, agreed that the £1.3 million would all go towards flooding, um, that it will all go towards um, supporting um, preventative measures and preparedness to mitigate against future flooding. It also tasked myself, um, the Environment Minister, the DFP Minister, and the DRD Minister to report by next Thursday's executive meeting how actually we will allocate that 1.3 million, so to make suggestions to the executive. And I think that we need to take a look at, one, assessing the damage that's being done to businesses, farmers included in that, who are also businesses, and we also need to take a, a look at um, what other measures need to be supported. So do we need to look at rural roads being raised, for example? Do we need to look at um, what other needs rivers agency have, um, practical things that they can do on the ground? But for me, the priority has to be about preventative measures. Mrs. Kelly, for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the minister for her answer? But she still hasn't answered my specific question. Has she made a, a representation to her executive colleagues that the uh, businesses which have been victims of the flooding incident will be compensated in some way by this executive? I can't say it any clearer than what I've said, that the executive agreed after some discussion yesterday that we will take a look at the £1.3 million pound and how best we spend that money. I would much rather protect businesses against flooding as opposed to giving them money to clean up after it. Call Mr Sean Rogers for thank, technical th questions. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, what steps is DARD taking to ensure the Water Framework Directive is enforced? I'm thinking particularly here of good water quality for our aquaculture industry. Obviously, we're... <laughs> I didn't know if he was finished, sorry. <laughs> You'll, obviously, we have to um, work towards uh, implementing the Water Framework Directive, and it's part of our day and daily business, not just in my department, but very keenly, obviously, within the Department of the Environment. A supplementary question for Mr Rogers. But when, when the directive is, is not met and uh, some of our aquaculture farmers have to close down, you just can't move your stock from one place to the other, is there any recompense for, for those farmers? I think perhaps maybe we need to pick up the conversation outside of um, the, the question time because I think we need to talk more in specifics around the challenges, but I'm very happy to do that because obviously I um, very much support the aquaculture sector. We're going to have um, an international conference uh, later this year which is actually going to look at the needs of the aquaculture sector and to target supports and um, key areas of research, for example, for, for that sector, and that's going to happen later this year under the auspices of the North-South Ministerial Council. I mean, 